Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, my name is Kelsey Condon, and I'm the manager for banking financial regulation at the Series Accelerator. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the Accelerator works with regulators and financial institutions to integrate climate risk into risk management frameworks. Next slide, please. Uh, we are joined by the OCC's Dr. Nina Chen and the FHFA's Dan Coates. Dr. Chen leads the OCC's climate risk efforts related to supervision, policy, and external engagements and oversees all activities of the Office of Climate Risk. Mr. Coates serves as FHFA's Deputy Director of Division Research and Statistics and is the Chair of the Climate Change and ESG Steering Committee, where he is responsible for enhancing FHFA's regulatory policies, revision, and oversight. This webinar will be recorded and available online afterwards. We will first review what climate risk is and then move on to an overview of the 2022 scorecard series released in June, which benchmarked U.S. financial regulator progress on climate-related financial risk management. We will also review developments in the scorecard's public publication and several recommendations for further action. Because we have the FHFA and OCC here, we will focus mostly on the other seven agencies. Dr. Chen and Mr. Coates will then give remarks uh, regarding their agency's progress. We will conclude with approximately 15 minutes of Q&A. Throughout the presentations, you'll be able to submit questions for this Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> First, let's review why climate risk is financial risk. In 2021 alone, you at the U.S. experienced 20 separate billion-dollar climate disasters that together cost over $150 billion. To date, 2022 has seen $15 billion events. Even without including Hurricane Ian, Ian the Western wildfires, and Hurricane Fiona, the final costs of which are still being determined, these events cost $30 billion. Some estimates put Hurricane Ian alone at twice that cost. Next slide, please. In general, climate risk is broken down into physical risk and transition risk. Physical risk is the financial losses associated with the loss or devaluation of physical, physical impacts of climate events. This includes point in time events like the previous slide demonstrated, as well as progressive risks such as resource scarcity. Next slide, please. Transition risk is forward-looking, the risks that businesses face as conditions change. These risks stem from changes in laws and regulation, technological, technological shifts, market preferences, and reputational damages. Next slide, please. Socioeconomic risks also arise where climate risk is present, resulting in impacts such as productivity loss and forced migration. Next slide, please. While there are substantial dangers from ignoring climate risks, there are also financial opportunities, such as technological advancements, energy efficiency, and access to new markets, which can result in reduced operating costs, asset diversification, and increased revenue. Next slide, please. While we won't go into detail here, there are over a dozen central banks and prudential regulators that are already regulating climate-related financial risk and or conducting climate scenarios around the world. Next slide, please. In the U.S., our financial regulators have also begun to assess and manage climate risk. This includes the Financial uh, Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, whose membership includes nine federal financial regulators. Last year, FSOC issued a report identifying climate risk as an emerging and increasing threat to U.S. financial stability. Next slide, please. All but one of the agencies we assessed for the scorecard is a member of FSOC, and their actions were reviewed based on the recommendations in the FSOC report. In the time since publication, uh, the, since the publication of our 2021 scorecard, there has been substantial progress, or there is still much to do. Together, the nine agencies we assess, as you can see here, Fed, FDIC, OCC, NCUA, SEC, MSRB, CFTC, FHFA, and Treasury, um, together um, took more than 230 public actions to address climate-related financial risk. Next slide, please. The first category we assessed was just affirming uh, climate risk as, as systemic risk. All nine agencies publicly affirmed um, that climate risk is a systemic risk to the financial system. The public, uh, this public affirmation sends a strong signal to the market that U.S. regulators have analyzed the current market dynamics and are taking climate-related financial risk seriously. All market participants, including investors, financial institutions, companies, states, and municipalities, should heed their expert findings and prepare to deal with those risks. Next slide, please. All nine agencies have also made progress in identifying the data needed to evaluate these risks and develop a plan to procure additional necessary data. Having consistent and reliable data will allow agencies, investors, companies, and other market participants to measure and analyze climate-related financial risks, assisting each of these actors to appropriately respond to identified risks. Some good examples of research and data collection include the Treasury's Climate Hub, 
um, which was recently stood up, which will allow pilot participants to integrate uh, climate related data from across the federal government with their public supervisory data for a more precise view of the relationship between climate change and financial stability risk. And similar to the FSOC report, CFTC released a climate related financial risk report in 2020 that reviewed potential implications of climate risk, as well as numerous recommendations for financial regulators. Next slide, please. For those agencies with authority that encompass the needs of financially vulnerable communities, there was greater variation in progress. Financially vulnerable communities, which include lower income communities and communities of color, are disproportionately burdened by the climate related physical risks, as well as, as well as the financial risks that accompany both increasingly devastating climate impacts and the efforts to address climate related financial risks. Only one agency has made notable progress on addressing these impacts on climate change on financially vulnerable communities, while three agencies have made no progress. One of the most important actions was the proposed updates Community Reinvestment Act by the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and OCC this summer. Next slide, please. If the climate resiliency provisions remain in the final rule, financial institutions covered under the CRA will be encouraged to help meet the credit needs of climate vulnerable communities through loans, investment, and other services that will allow these communities to prepare for and build resilience to future climate-related events. Next slide, please. Each agency has also designated staff to focus on climate-related risks with all but one appointing senior staff to lead those teams and all but one creating climate-designated working groups or committees. It is essential that regulators expand internal capacity through increased staffing, training, expertise, and budget in order to meet the size and scope of the challenges that climate financial risk poses. Most agencies have announced, uh, announced these staff publicly, and we encourage every agency to share this critical advance with the public. Next slide, please. There was substantially less progress on improving climate-related disclosures. The CFTC's climate-related financial risk report, um, risk, risk requests for information published this summer includes five questions specifically addressing how CFTC should incorporate disclosure requirements into its supervision and regulation. The MSRB also made updates to its online disclosure tool, EMMA, which now includes indicators to allow investors to see if new bonds include climate-related ESG criteria. Although the Treasury has a more limited regulatory role in this area, it is an active member of the Financial Stability Board, or FSB, task force working to establish enhanced climate-related corporate disclosures. And as many of you may know, the SEC has made the most progress in this area. Next slide, please. The SEC's proposed rule for mandatory climate disclosure released earlier this year would ensure investors have adequate information on climate risk. The rule would not only respond to considerable investor demand, but also facilitate data consistency and comparability. This will facilitate more accurate pricing of these risks and help reduce market shocks to an unprepared market. Such disclosures serve to protect investors as well as the safety and soundness of institutions while maintaining a fair, efficient, and resilient market. Investors and international financial institutions are, and large and international financial institutions are generally supportive of the rule overall with caveats, as it would harmonize SEC expectations with frameworks utilized on a global scale and provide information investors have been asking for. Next slide, please. And finally, several agencies are beginning to incorporate climate risk into their supervisory activities. The FHFA instructed Fannie and Freddie to, de to designate climate change as a priority concern and actively consider its effects in their decision-making monitors how they address climate risk through regular, through regular meetings and assesses their climate resiliency in an annual scorecard. The SEC proposed climate disclosure rule would, uh, would require companies to disclose how they are assessing, measuring, and managing climate-related financial risks. The OCC and FDIC, and as of last week, the Fed, published proposed climate principles. The regula regulatory proposals by the SEC, OCC, FDIC, and Fed are major steps towards reducing the impacts of climate-related financial risks to our economy. Issuance of uniform binding guidance by the three banking agencies could avoid regulatory inconsistency and ease compliance costs for regulated entities. While sever several other agencies have issued requests for information on these topics, the remaining agencies assessed in the scorecard have not made appreciable publicly announced progress toward improving regulated entities climate related risk disclosures or including climate risk in their supervision of regulated entities. Next slide please. 
Dr. Chen will cover more of OCC's climate risk management efforts, but we will briefly review the climate principles that the three banking regulators have released. Although the principles are non-binding guidance, not regulation, they identify climate risk as a threat to bank safety and soundness and to overall financial stability. The guidance is divided into general areas such as governance, risk management, and scenario analysis, and describes how risk can be addressed, providing a proposed framework for how financial institutions should measure and manage climate risk through their, throughout their business. The Fed also recently announced similar proposed climate principles for which the comment period is still open. Next slide, please. Since publication of the scorecard this summer, there has been significant progress. FHFA and NCUA held events that focused on climate risk, and FSAC launched its Climate-Related Financial Advisory Committee. Treasury's Office of Financial Research launched the Climate Hub, which we discussed earlier, and Treasury's Federal Insurance Office, office issued an RFI seeking public input on climate-related financial risks and their impact on the insurance industry. The OCC also announced uh, its creation of the Office of Climate Risk, which Dr. Chen now heads. As mentioned, the Fed just last week published draft climate principles. The Fed also announced this fall that it will begin a climate scenario analysis pilot in 2023 for the six largest U.S. banks, which are Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo. Next slide, please. And next slide. Um, Ceres has numerous recommendations for each agency, which can broadly be broken down into explicitly integrating climate risk into provincial supervision frameworks conducting research and collecting data, increasing transparency, considering climate vulnerable communities, and developing educational and training materials. While we will not go through each individually, they will be available with this slide deck after today's webinar. Next slide, please. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Chen, the Chief Climate Risk Officer at the OCC. Thanks to Ceres for inviting me to this webinar. So I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an overview of the OCC's work on climate-related financial risk. The OCC's attention uh, to climate-related financial risk is on prudential supervision of the federal, bank federal banking system. And it's very much on safety and soundness implications of climate-related financial risk. Our role is to ensure that national banks and the federal saving associations understand their climate-related financial risks and develop risk management framework and the capabilities to identify, measure, monitor, and control those risks. The OCC has prioritized large banks and is currently working to finalize principles for climate-related financial risk management for large banks with more than 100 billion in total assets. So climate-related financial risks have the potential to affect the safety and soundness of banks in the forms of fiscal and transitional risk. Uh, OCC's focus is on risk management, it's not on industry policy. We do not have a view on which technology should be used for power generation, for example. We also do not have expectations that banks need to contribute to lower the greenhouse gas emission or have net zero targets. And we definitely do not direct capital flow uh, to or away from certain sectors and companies. We focus on developing supervisory expectations for climate risk management, first and foremost on large banks, those with total assets greater than 100 billion. We're focusing on understanding how these large banks are developing the risk management framework, data, risk management, risk measurements, disclosure, scenario analysis, and uh, understanding the impact of consumers and communities from climate-related financial risk. We also engaged in active dialogues with the FDIC and the Federal Reserve and other federal agencies to coordinate actions on climate-related financial risks. The financial risk from climate change may also have a financial stability implication. In October 2021, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC, released its report on climate-related financial risk to better understand climate risk and take necessary steps to ensure the resilience of the financial system for such risk. So now let me uh, go a bit deeper into how we're thinking about climate-related financial risk. Um, 
these risks have the potential to affect the safety and soundness of banks through fiscal and transition risk, which affects, affect various sectors of the economy. Kelsey has given you the background on of both fiscal and the transition risks. The impact of physical and transition risk on the financial system can be material and may also include damage to property, uh, impediments to business activity, shifts in the values of assets, and the effects on incomes. Physical and transition risks generally manifest themselves in a variety of ways in the traditional risk areas. For example, strategic risk, reputational risk, credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk, operational risk, and compliance risk. There are significant and complex challenges for banks and the regulators in understanding these risks, which will require the evolving development and application of risk management frameworks. So the OCC is focusing on understanding how banks, uh, our large banks, are developing their risk management frameworks, data, risk measures, disclosure, scenario analysis, and uh, uh, consumer and community impacts. Banks have traditionally sh have shown historical resilience in dealing with acute weather events using risk mitigation tactics, including insurance and working with borrowers. However, additional risk identification and the monitoring capabilities may need to be developed to effectively manage the full range of climate-related financial risks, such as uh, transition risk and the chronic fiscal risk. So now let me share the status of OCC's supervisory efforts. So on December 16th, 2021, the OCC issued uh, OCC Bulletin 2021-62, uh, requesting public comment on the principles for climate-related risk management for large banks, and is currently reviewing comments received. Although all banks, regardless of size, may have material exposure to climate-related financial risks, these initial principles are targeted at banks with more than um, total consolidated assets of 100 billion. The OCC plans to work with, on an interagency basis with the FRB and the FDIC on these principles. Like Kelsey mentioned, the FDIC issued its proposed principles uh, in substantially similar form as that of the OCC for comments on March um, 30th, 2022. And the FRB just issued its proposed principles, also uh, in substantially similar form as uh, those of the OCC and FDIC for comments last week. Additional public input on these uh, draft principles will benefit all three federal banking agencies. The OCC also plans to elaborate on these principles for large banks in subsequent guidance to provide additional information on supervisory expectations for the risk management of climate risk exposures. The OCC included a discussion of climate-related financial risk in the semi-annual risk perspective for spring 2022. We plan to address climate-related financial risk and the status of supervisory expectations in the semi-annual risk perspective for this fall as well. We also plan to take a risk-based approach to the consideration of climate-related financial risks. This approach will include tailoring supervisory expectations to reflect differences in banks' circumstances and the climate risk profiles. The OCC will communicate any new expectations um, prior to any examination work when, and will also provide transition time for banks to prepare for the new expectations. We expect banks to develop proportionate risk management system relative to the organization's size, complexity, and the risk profile. Currently, the largest banks should continue to build on climate risk management framework, including the use of scenario and other models of uh, modes of analysis is appropriate. We do not anticipate conducting climate risk exams in missiles and the community banks for some time, and these banks should use the time wisely. 
Then in terms of the OCC resources and collaborations on climate-related financial risk, um, like Kelsey mentioned earlier, in April this year, we established the Office of Climate Risk to support the agency's effort to improve institutions' climate risk management capabilities and address climate-related financial risks. I joined uh, the agency as the Chief Climate Risk Officer this September. The OCC has established the National Climate Risk Implementation Committee, which includes members from supervision, policy, law, and economics, to focus on the agency's work on the safety and soundness aspects of climate-related financial risk. The OCC is also active internationally on climate-related financial risk issues and participates in such groups um, as the, the Basel Committee on Bank Supervisions, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Risk, and the Network for Greening the Financial System. We also coordinate with FSOC members on climate-related financial risk, including to assess and implement the recommendations from the FSOC climate report, which I mentioned earlier. In accordance with the FSOC report, the FSOC formed the Climate-Related Financial Risk Committee. Uh, the FSOC is also focused on increasing the resources and expertise on climate-related risk for individual FSOC members, including public communication of climate-related efforts and working towards obtaining a better understanding of the adverse impact on communities and households from climate-related financial risk. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, I will now turn it over to the chair of FHFA's Climate Change and ESG Steering Committee, Dan Coates. Mr. Coates is joined by Jessica Shui, who is the project coordinator for that working group. Um, uh, I'd like to talk to you about what FHFA uh, has been doing to address climate-related financial risk in the housing finance sector. Climate-related financial risks and their solutions are important areas of focus at FHFA. We recognize that climate change affects the lives of many. It increases risks of property damage and exposes the housing finance system to potential financial risk. We also recognize that it may have disproportionate effects on vulnerable communities and households that are too resource constrained to make climate resilient improvements to their homes or to recover from damages. We've been thinking about climate change and the implications for the housing finance system for years now. And back in about 2013, we set up an agency-wide disaster response team that coordinated and continues to coordinate with our regulated entities, government agencies, and external stakeholders during natural disasters to provide temporary relief to homeowners and renters in the immediate aftermath of a natural disaster. But climate risk management is still relatively new to us. We're still working to identify the channels through which physical risks, such as natural disasters, as well as transition risks, such as the energy transition and policy changes in response to climate change, may lead to adverse financial effects for homeowners, renters, and FHFA's regulated entities. And we're still figuring out appropriate ways to manage those risks. Once we have a better understanding of these issues, the next step will be to figure out ways for these potential consequences to be considered by our regulated entities and us during the normal course of policymaking and risk management. This year has been a, a fundamental year for us to learn and build capacity in this area. While I can't discuss the future of policy or programmatic changes, I'd like to go over some of the work we've done and are doing. Uh, as you saw briefly in the overview of the 2022 Sirius scorecard, we've been actively working on enhancing our understanding regarding climate risks and addressing it. For example, we held a public listening session and request for input in 2021 on climate and natural disaster risk management. The listening session and a summary of the RFI input, that is the feedback we got, are available on our agency's website. Early this year, as a result really of a lot of the input we got from that listening session, 
uh, we established the climate change and ESG working groups. Um, we did this to leverage um, uh, the expertise of staff all across the agency uh, to better identify, understand, and address climate-related risks. Our working groups include groups dedicated to climate-related data collection and research, risk exposure assessments, risk governance, green bonds, reporting and disclosures, consumer protection, uh, and even our own agency's footprint. We also have a legal working group to advise these other working groups. <clears throat> we also established a steering committee overseeing the working groups. Um, the steering committee is consists of division heads and office heads <clears throat> um, to, to really make sure that the entire agency was working on and aware of climate-related risks. In terms of climate risk assessment, our staff are busy working with the regulated entities to identify risks and identify data that are already available, but and also data we still need to get to measure those risks. Uh, they're also working to identify the appropriate scenario analyses and stress tests that we need to do and ensure our regulated entities do to make sure that they remain safe and sound and able to achieve their housing finance mission under a range of adverse outcomes in climate-related transition policy changes and developments. Uh, our group is also looking at external vendors uh, for things like climate risk data and analytics um, and uh, uh, models, uh, climate-related models. They're also working with our regulated entities to incorporate climate change into governance, including dedicated staff uh, and establishing responsibilities, <clears throat> both at the firm level and the board level. We've also been thinking about flood insurance. Um, uh, each of our main, our, our larger, uh, Fannie and Freddie, shall we say, uh, require properties when they purchase loans uh, those loans have to have uh, flood insurance for the life of the loan uh, if those loans are in a special um, uh, flood hazard area. So our, our data and research group is trying to better understand how flood risk, both inside and outside the special flood hazard areas, um, uh, manifests and risks from other perils as well, and how all that is translated into financial risk. In relation to uh, uh, better understanding the effects of climate events within the housing finance, or finance sector, our data and research working group has been focused on four research projects. These projects entail a natural hazard risk and mortgage finance literature review, um, uh, also measuring ex enterprise exposure to flood risk in the first instance, uh, assessing the effect of hurricanes on mortgage uh, performance across different borrower demographics, and measuring the impact of natural disasters on home pr house price indices. Now, all of this work is work in progress, so uh, I'm not prepared at this uh, juncture to talk about the results from that. <clears throat> um, as mentioned on their websites, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a variety of loan programs to afford to to support not only affordable housing but also the financing of energy efficient homes and home improvements, <clears throat> including resiliency. Uh, Fannie Mae's Homestyle Energy Mortgage and Freddie Mac's Green Choice Mortgage Programs help single family borrowers finance energy related home improvements uh, through their mortgage when they're purchasing or refinancing a home. Uh, Fannie Mae's Homestyle Energy Mortgage Program also offers financing for resiliency upgrades. Freddie Mac's Choice Renovation Program offers incentives for borrowers who use loan proceeds for home improvements, which, as I mentioned, can include resiliency enhancements. Within the multifamily sphere, Freddie Mac's Green Advantage Program and Fannie Mae's Green Rewards Program provide a pricing reduction for multifamily properties uh, for multifamily borrowers who commit to property improvements 
projected to yield certain levels of energy and water consumption reduction, which ultimately result in borrower and tenant utility savings. The GSEs provide liquidity to these mortgage markets by acquiring loans and issuing MBS that meet certain ESG program objectives. Collateral eligibility criteria depend on the varying programs. For example, green bond programs. Uh, for green bond programs, the GSEs securitize their energy efficient, efficiency program loans uh, and loans with green building certifications, for example, Energy Star or HERS ratings. Um, um, also, just in November, FHFA updated our uh, the 2023 enterprise multifamily loan caps that finance energy or water, water efficiency improvements with units at or below 80% of area median income to call those mission-driven. Uh, while each enterprise has done work to provide incentives to improve the water and energy efficiency and climate resiliency for single and multifamily homes, we're always looking for ways we can do things better. And our Green Bonds Working Group is researching the standards and the framework for green bond programs. We're in the early stages of working with the enterprises to look for any improvements that might be warranted. Our, work, our reporting and disclosure group has worked with our regulated entities uh, to enhance comparability of their, of their reports, uh, consistency, and, and transparency. You know, Fannie and Freddie have issued what are called SASB reports. These are voluntary reports, and we've been working to ensure that the data in those reports are comparable across the entities. Um, uh, each of these entities will continue to issue these voluntary reports, um, at least until the SEC's regulation goes final. And we're also working with them to prepare for the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule, um, which uh, it, when it goes final will contain GHG uh, emission metrics. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to get done to comply with that disclosure rule. Our consumer protection working group includes staff from our uh, Office of Fair Lending Oversight, and they're considering the effects of climate risk and solutions on consumers, especially those belonging to vulnerable communities. Uh, as I mentioned, our agency operations working group is looking for ways to reduce our own climate footprint. Um, and we, like, <clears throat> like the OCC, um, participate in a number of uh, uh, interagency working groups. Uh, for example, we're members of the FSOC's Climate Related Financial Risk Committee. Um, we're members of the Network of Central Banks and Supervisors for Greening the Financial System, or NGFS, uh, and we are members of the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, uh, which uh, spends part of their time talking about climate issues. We just joined these groups this year, and we're really um, enjoying our participation in those important groups. We also, I should say, meet with other financial regulators uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, 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 quarterly to talk specifically about climate issues. Uh, we held an econ summit, as we call it, uh, on November 1st with sessions on climate stress testing um, and, and uh, also academic analyses of the effect of climate change on vulnerable communities. The summit brought together stakeholders from government, industry, and academia, and it was a really helpful uh, discussion of these important topics. Um, lastly, I'd like to say that I'm, um, I'm sure most of you understand here that much of our work with our regulated entities um, falls within the purview of supervisory uh, confidential supervisory work. So we can't always talk about the things we're doing with these regulated entities, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the home loan banks. But I, what I can say is that uh, our, our um, uh, director uh, last December issued a public statement saying that climate change is a priority, not only for FHFA, but for its regulated entities. Um, so that's a pretty strong statement from her, and it elicited uh, uh, the responses you might expect from our regulated entities. Um, um, 
that's it for me now. I can't talk about future work we're going to do, but I'm looking forward to hearing your questions um, and suggestions that you might have so that we can uh, be as effective as possible. Thanks for your time. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, and we will now transition to the Q&A portion. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your, of your Zoom uh, browser. Um, so we have one so far, um, and I'll, I'll try and tackle the first two and then let uh, Dan and Nina see if they can answer the last one. Um, so it asks what our opinion of the timing of the SEC guidelines becoming effective will be. Um, and <laughs> I'm sure as the two regulators here would tell you, there's probably not a lot that um, SEC can say publicly. I think on behalf of Ceres, um, we're, we're hoping that it comes out soon. There's been you know, a lot of movement there, a lot of discussion. So, you know, hoping, hoping that it comes out soon. Um, and more generally, the potential impact of climate regulations based on possible political landscape changes, I think, um, on, on behalf of Ceres, we don't see climate risk management as a political issue. It's not, um, you know, it's not about climate change. It's about risk management. Um, it's about the risks that uh, financial institutions and other market participants face from um, from the climate events, as we were discussing. So, it's, you know, our opinion is that it's just a risk management issue. It's not anything to do with with the political um, makeup. Um, and then the last question here, um, please speak to the data challenges and lack of standardization. Um, Dan, I don't know if you want to take that one first. Um, yeah, the data challenges. Um, <clears throat> it's there are there are many. <clears throat> I mentioned a few of them in trying to discuss uh, GHG emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> so um, what kind of emissions come from our suppliers, what kind of emissions are our regulated entities financing? How do you measure that? <clears throat> uh, if you think of trying to measure it, you know, uh, by structure, you might say, well, the older is the, the structure, uh, maybe the more likely is it'll have uh, more emissions, except that um, a lot of older homes, uh, uh, I was originally from, Se uh, from Seattle, and a lot of homes there are quite old, uh, not by East Coast standards, but uh, relative to them they are. But a lot of them have been retrofitted uh, to be much more efficient. So it's it's just really difficult to get that kind of data. <clears throat> uh, data on insurance coverage um, uh, is also uh, difficult to obtain, especially when it's not mandatorily required. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that is, um, optimistic on this front is the FSOC's uh, Climate Risk Data Hub, uh, Data and Analytics Hub, I think they're setting up. <clears throat> and FHFA is on the, uh, on the waiting list, shall we say, to be a test user of that, of that climate data hub. So the, the goal of that work uh, that is being done by the Office of Financial Research on behalf of the FSOC is to try to get all these agencies together and get some standardized data and allow us all to use it. Um, uh, so that's, <clears throat> that's uh, a little bit about the data. Um, uh, uh, I would just say also that, you know, uh, we, we have to be thoughtful and mindful about releasing data <clears throat> um, because um, you know, we, we're trying to make adjustments here in a way that don't um, uh, devalue uh, uh, people's investments in their homes. There are many people in this country who are in climate vulnerable areas, and they are there often because of, uh, of past redlining or other considerations where they end up in uh, climate vulnerable areas. And those folks... Uh, Many of those homeowners have spent uh, perhaps decades building equity in their homes. Uh, and it, a wholesale policy change or data release saying, oh, by the way, these are the homes that are most vulnerable, uh, could serve to uh, wipe out a huge swath of wealth um, for these most vulnerable among us. So I think we have to be very conscious 
and thoughtful about how we release data. Um, uh, one point I would make to one of your other points, Kelsey, and then I'll shut up and let, let Nina talk, is, is just that, <clears throat> um, you know, I don't think it's a political issue either. Um, you know, I keep this series card near me, you know, <laughs> because um, series is always asking us, what are you all doing? And, you know, I think of it as, as you know, a firm uh, like the ones we regulate uh, needs to keep in mind its investor base. They need to keep in mind their ability to achieve their housing finance mission. They need to keep in mind their, uh, their safety and soundness. And these things are not political. These are just, you know, uh, this, is, this is happening. I was able to listen to a paper given by a Fed researcher earlier today, uh, and this person talked about sea level rise in the Miami area, uh, rising 10 feet. Uh, that's, that's, that's a physical thing. That's a, that's a potential reality that we have to deal with. Uh, and he showed a, a map of the Miami area and what happens when you get higher and higher sea level rise. Um, and that just, that's just a, a reality that I think we have to deal with. And I really don't think this is a political issue. I know people are trying to make it one, but we think of it as a safety and soundness issue. Uh, um, I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Nina, I don't know if you have anything to add on the, on the data piece and issues with standardization. Yeah, um, definitely we recognize data is a challenging issue. That's why we are very keen in participating in the FSOC working groups, um, trying to figure out standardization um, among the federal agencies and also think about how we can promote consistency and how uh, and looking at which kind of data we should be procuring, uh, what we can develop. Um, so hopefully uh, with the FSOC effort, uh, we can make some progress here. Absolutely. And Dan, I think you covered this a little bit in your last answer, but um, does FHFA see any potential worrying trade-offs between GSE affordability goals and, and managing climate risk? And then I think a little bit connected to that is how much of the impact, how much impact is the IRA factoring into those current risk assessments? So we're trying to, we're trying to think of uh, sustainable home ownership. <clears throat> as not only uh, being able to afford a home in the classic um, you know, loan to value and other credit risk underwriting characteristics, but also in terms of the costs of maintaining that home. And the one way to think about it is, is, is flood insurance costs. So if um, you know, we, we wanna make sure that people get into homes um, uh, that maybe they haven't had the opportunity to get into in the past, but we want to make sure they can handle all the costs that will come with that, with owning that home. And in in flood prone areas, it is quite reasonable to expect insurance rates to continue to rise. And so that's that's kind of the way, at least I think you know we're thinking about affordability. It's all mixed into climate, and and I just don't know how you can think about affordability without uh, without thinking about um, uh, the transition costs and the physical risks that come from climate. Hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and for either of you, is the is the IRA factoring to, into any of your current risk assessments? <clears throat> well, um, um, I think it it offers great opportunities. <clears throat> Um, uh, it, it's, it's a, there's a lot of good things in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and one of the things we're thinking about is how can um, our regulated entities be a, a force multiplier for some of those things? I, I don't have an answer for you yet, but I can tell you that we, we are actively thinking about it. Thank you. Um, and this this next question, uh, what specific treasury guidelines are there at this time or in the foreseeable future? Um, so as we briefly touched on, treasury is a little bit of a different animal than some of the other regulatory agencies that we assessed in terms of they don't have direct oversight over, over as many regulated entities. So they, um, as we discussed, have 
you know, release some RFIs from their Office of Financial Research and um, Insurance Office, um, mostly to collect data. And as Dan was talking about, the Climate Hub to help the other financial regulators um, with their own data collection and processing. So um, in terms of guidelines, we hope to see more of that sort of thing, more, more RFIs to, um, again, gather more data and gain a better understanding of what data is needed and how to use it. Um, rather than actual regulation on part of the treasury. Um, so next question we have. Um, uh, how would the results of a climate scenario analysis or stress test uh, potentially be used? Um, Nina, if you want to take that one first, then maybe Dan. Sure. So uh, currently, OCC is not considering a climate scenario analysis uh, in our proposed uh, draft principles. We're very clear that uh, the way we think about climate scenario analysis is different from the traditional stress test. It's not about capital. It's an exercise to understand capacity, to understand where potential exposures are, to understand the, the data gap or where you uh, where institution might need to develop their staff at, um, capability and also the strategic positioning of the banks. So it's uh, very different from traditional stress tests, which is very uh, capital focused in the very short term. Um, so because uh, you mentioned earlier that the Fed has announced that it's going to conduct a scenario analysis uh, early next year. And uh, um, other regulators, international regulators have done scenario analysis and uh, say, most of them have the focus on developing the capacity both at the regulator as well as the, at the institutions and then also help to highlight where the exposures might be uh, understand what the potential management actions are um, management um, strategies to respond to this risk yeah so um um as Nina mentioned, uh, these types of analyses are not to set capital levels. Um, <clears throat> right, we are working on uh, having uh, uh, regulated entities conduct some sort of scenario analyses and stress tests. <clears throat> um, uh, but I, you know, there right now, um, they we're we're doing a lot of work to figure out what those scenarios should be. Uh, we're working with NGFS and trying to learn about what they're doing and how to downscale those or regionalize those for <clears throat> areas of the US um, and trying to make sure that we have the data to run these scenarios um, and, and also stress tests. And when I say stress tests, in my mind anyway, I think of like what if scenarios, like what if we had a large number of natural disasters uh, over a fairly short period of time. So it's it's not your, you know, these, I feel like we should come up with different terms because every time uh, we mention scenario analyses and stress tests, people think of, of DFAST and, and, and capital stress tests. This is not that, these are climate related uh, efforts. And really um, the effort now is just to understand how vulnerable or not our regulated entities are. <clears throat> and I can't emphasize enough, our entities are new to this. We are new to this. We have entities of uh, fairly large size and complexity, and we have through the home loan banks, some smaller uh, sized uh, firms. So what we ask of each of them will likely be different depending on their capabilities. And all of this uh, um, is initially at least just for our uh, confidential supervisory consumption. Uh, so that's what I mentioned earlier. A lot of what we're doing is behind the scenes in the classic regulator sense. Um, it's a long way from there to public disclosure of the results of those scenarios because we, we as the supervisor and regulator have to get a sense of comfort that these results make sense. And we are all, and I mean everybody, is so new to this that um, I, I, know, I know everybody wants these results and they want them now. Uh, they want the data and they want it now. Uh, but we are, we are doing what we always do. We're being careful and deliberate and serious. And, and uh, that may, maybe is not uh, 
aligned with everyone's timeline, but it's 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 the way we we operate. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it is. And maybe maybe to follow up on that, um, since you said that you know your regulated entities, Randy and Freddie, they're they're new to this. Um, are there any questions that you're getting from them that that have been helpful in in moving forward conversation? Yeah, I mean, they're as you might imagine, they're concerned with data. <clears throat> Where can they get? Uh, you know, can they get adequate data? Um, uh, we've we talked with uh, third parties about how to measure uh, greenhouse gases. <clears throat> that's a that's a <laughs> uh, that's a that's a fairly difficult uh, thing uh, to do. Um, and they, like us, are trying to figure out the right modeling platforms uh, to use um, and whether they have the data uh, to feed those modeling platforms. So there's just there's just a heck of a lot to do here. And, um, you know, they're struggling like we are to 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 make I mean, they're not struggling in their intensity and in their effort. They're all devoted to working seriously about this. But it is a heavy, heavy uh, load, and there's a lot to do. Um, and you know they have to do work that their external auditors and external counsel and their boards will be comfortable with. Uh, and everybody takes a sharp pencil and a skeptical eye to these things. And then there's the regulator, like us, that you know comes in. So um, I'm really uh, gratified by how seriously our regulated entities are taking this, but I, I don't want uh, the outside world to get an optimistic, a too optimistic of a view of when this all is going to manifest into something that the outside world can read about, because it's just, it's just, there's a lot to do and a lot of uh, data and methodology issues to deal with. Thank you. Yeah, and, and similar type of question for you, Nina, but maybe um, what are some good examples of climate risk management that you've seen at, at some of the financial institutions that OCC oversees? You know, Bank of America and Wells come to mind. Yeah, so at this stage, um, it's too early for us to conclude on what the best practices are. We're still in a process of understanding what our large banks are doing. Um, they're consistent with our draft principles having strong governance is a foundational. Um, some banks have already done that. Um, some banks are establishing their climate-related uh, governance structure. Um, some banks have clear designations of roles and responsibilities for who is in charge of climate-related financial risk, what the team structures are, what staffing is like. So to do this work well, banks need to dedicate resources to identify, measure, manage, and monitor climate-related financial risks that are relevant to them. Now, again, I also want to emphasize we're only focusing on banks with 100 billion and above assets, which have the resources to do so and have started this work. Uh, among these large banks, we have also seen some started to engage with their customers to understand how their customers see climate-related financial risks and how they plan to manage this risk. Yeah, thank you. And um, maybe if we have time for just one or two other questions, if anyone has something that they haven't dropped into the Q&A yet. Um, Otherwise, I, I might have some more questions for our, for our panelists. Well, I would um, just, mm -hmm. just to add to uh, the good things we've seen, I think the way the enterprises have come to deal with disasters uh, and the forbearance options they make available to homeowners when their homes are, are affected by disasters that I touched on earlier is really um, you know, a, a, good, a good example to cite. Uh, uh, um, I think also uh, our regulated entities have, as Nina mentioned, enhanced their governance structure uh, to deal with, with climate issues. Uh, so that's been something that's been gratifying for us this year. If you look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's governance of climate change, uh, it's really been ramped up both at the senior executive level and the board level. And lastly, I would say the home loan banks uh, uh, held a climate uh, stress testing and scenario analysis symposium 
uh, this past June uh, and invited a bunch of outside experts to come and we'll talk to them about this. Again, it's a long process, but it demonstrates that our regulated entities are taking this seriously, uh, which is, is a good thing. Absolutely. Um, we have, looks like we have a couple more. Um, um, I think, Dan, you pretty much already covered this. Um, are you concerned um, that climate vulnerable communities will be re-redlined by regulated lenders on perceived risk caused by, caused by climate? And how would you respond? I think Dan gave a pretty, um, pretty good overview of how FHFA was responding to that. Um, they also have a bit more information on their website. Um, um, and in terms of for the OCC, FDIC, and Fed, you know, I don't want to speak um, for Nina, but um, their most recent um, proposed updates to the Community Reinvestment Act include climate resiliency provisions. So that would help balance out some of that perceived tension um, in terms of helping those communities build resilience um, to to this. So it would kind of help fight um, maybe a blue lining or climate red lining, as as you've mentioned. I don't know if Nina wants to add anything to that, but that's. Um, I think it's definitely a big concern for, for every agency, but something that's being thought about. Yeah, I would I just say that uh, while it's a longer term effort, uh, we, we and, the, and Fannie and Freddie are working on the loan application form process to ensure that there's more information uh, on the loan application forms uh, in the future. And these won't come out the way the, the pipeline works. It won't, won't manifest uh, for a couple of years yet. Uh, but again, it's it's trying to get more information uh, out to borrowers. Um, so hopefully that will help. Thank you. Um, yeah, it looks like we have one last question before before we wrap up here. Um, can the speakers talk to the impact of international regulations on their work? You know, maybe your involvement with NGFS. Um, yeah, so I can say that uh, um, some of in some international regulators have been doing this work for uh, longer than us, um, and uh, we definitely are looking at what they have been doing. And we're also very conscious of the different remit that some international regulators may have versus ours. And the OCC's uh, mission, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is very much on safety and soundness. On risk management is not about directing capital or about supporting the low carbon transition. Um, so what we are looking at what international regulators are doing and then thinking about what can uh, what's applicable for us. And we're also thinking about how international regulators' requirements might have impacts on our institutions that have international footprint. Yeah, that well said, Nina. Um, <clears throat> our entities don't have an international footprint except through the debt they they issue, which is purchased all around the world. <clears throat> but we, what I would say is we are uh, glad to be working with NGFS and glad, glad to be studying what other international entities are doing. And as Nina said, studying it and figuring out if it's applicable for us or not. So um, really, really grateful to be a, a part of that group. If we just throw up our last couple of slides, just to, to wrap up here, um, well, we just really want to thank um, Dan and Nina for, sp for spending the time with us today and answering some questions. Um, Ceres has a, an event coming up this March, which focuses on both climate financial risk and other areas of climate sustainability. Um, and if you don't mind taking this survey on the next slide. Um, thank you for everyone for being here. I think you know, we we did a decent overview of what climate financial risk is and and where we're going from here. So again, thank you everyone, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.